Hello and welcome to another of our IndiePod Extras. And this one has a distinctly historical feel about it because we're going to be looking at the Battle of Loudon Hill. Now, if you're like me, you'd never heard of the Battle of Loudon Hill. Uh, nor me. <laughs> Not so until first... you mentioned it to me. Yeah. So the first I knew about it was when Neil, who is one of our podcast roving reporters, <laughs> sent me some footage from Loudon Hill. From the top of Loudon Hill. And then if you follow the burn there, up, there's a wall, if you can see that. And just after the wall, there's some lumpy ground, is a good way maybe of describing it. And that's shown on the map as Wallace's now, um, perhaps otherwise known as Wallace's grave. And that earthwork area could be where the supposed graves of um, the English who were defeated in battle here by Wallace were buried. Because we knew nothing about it, either of us, we thought we would tap into yeah. our favourite Scottish history consultant, Jenny Eels. And Jenny, of course, always happy to come on the show, joined us and gave us some historical background. I did get as far as uh, finding out just exactly where Loudon Hill is. Ooh, I didn't even know that, actually. I mean, it's down in Ayrshire, it's East mm -hmm. Ayrshire. Um, I think. And we've got a picture of the actual hill. Yeah, just want to tell us a bit about, about the battle, Jenny. I mean, you can see from your picture there, it's excellent terrain. And that was really where Bruce was at his best, um, was in terrain tactics and making, just planning ahead to the area of a proposed battle and they would arrange that. So for months leading up to the battle, there were ditches being dug and plans were being made to, to really get the, the right set up in order to wangle the English troops, the opposing faction, into having to approach from a certain angle, um, having to take certain routes uh, and then being hemmed in when it came to the battle. Uh, so, I mean, Bruce had um, already kind of shown his forte, if you like, uh, in that regard. Um, you're talking about Wallace, and Wallace had been betrayed and executed about two years previous to this battle. Right. Although Blind Harry, if he's to be believed, um, there had been a previous Battle of Loudon Hill in 1296, where Wallace was supposed to have taken a lead part. Um, oh. But Blind Harry is more a dealer of myths and legends than he is of facts. <laughs> so uh, the the actual Battle of Loudoun, of which there are historical records, was two years post Wallace. It was Bruce who was very much taking a lead in this and he was right in amongst the melee as far as the reports are concerned. He wasn't one of these leaders that hung back and just watched and direct and delegated folk. He, he was right in amongst it, you know. The previous year you had the Battle of Methven, where about 4,000 Scottish troops were killed, and that was actually by yeah. um, the faction headed by Aymer de Valence, or Aymer de Valence, who was the Earl of Pembroke, the second Earl of Pembroke. And uh, it was actually said Aymer de Valence, who was the opposing lead faction he was leader of the, the opposing faction at the B battle of Loudoun ah, Hill. Right, right. so really bruce was uh getting his own back yeah, yeah, um, yeah. for the battle of meth and where so many um scots had, had lost their lives but it was just another example of scots coming up against um an opposition that that far outweighed their own in terms of numbers uh the it balances earl of pembroke's like group were about five times the number wow. of the Scots wow. army uh, at the Battle of Loudon Hill. Um, and there had already been previous battles that, that year. I mean, if we're thinking that, that the Battle of Loudon Hill took place on the 10th of May, so in the first half of the year, there had already been the Battle of Turnberry, the Battle of Loch Ryan, the Battle of Glentrull, and then the Battle of Loudon Hill just in the start of that year alone. Wow. Because we're right in the middle of the war 
the War of Independence. So were all of those, did all of those previous ones that year, did, 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 um, did they also involve Aymer de Valence, Val the Pembroke era? Um, no, not as far as I'm aware. The, I think he was, his previous battle was the one that he'd won being the that at Methven. Right. And well, I mentioned before, like the, the Battle of Loudon Hill isn't really talked about very often because it comes like 10 years after the Battle of Stirling Bridge, yeah. uh, seven years before Bannockburn. And of course, those two battles are, are very well known. Um, mm. to, to anyone taking a wee glimpse at Scottish history. It is easy to get confused with because of Blind Harry and yeah. was Wallace there, was he not? Is it the one in 1296 you're talking about? Is it the 1307? You know, it's... Um, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately for Scotland, Edward I died very soon after the Battle of Loudon Hill, leaving his incompetent son and <laughs> to kind of take over and he wasn't really into to fighting with Scotland and came to a kind of resolution with Scots um, thereafter. Yeah, yeah. He didn't fulfill his dad's kind of like lasting wish either, did he? I think he was to take his bones on to further defeats of Scots. Um, <laughs> he was just buried down in Westminster and <laughs> Eddie the second just kind of got on with life. He just got on with life, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, <laughs> men you mentioned that, uh, you know, that, that Robert Bruce had you know, he'd he'd laid the ground, as it were. He'd he prepared. He, he'd he'd obviously worked out where he wanted oh, yeah. to have this battle and how to how to inveigle the English troops. Yeah, it spent months it, preparing to, to for the, that battle. So I found this. This is off. It's from Wikipedia. You know, the, it's a plan of of what happened. <laughs> I was looking at it and I thought, wow. So the green bit at the top, the brighter green bit at the top, that's the hill. That represents the hill. So and the three yellow. Um, groups. That's Bruce's men. And all the red ones lined up coming towards him, as it were, that's that's Earl of Pembroke's English forces. Mm. And you kind of look at it and you think, well, for goodness sake, who would do that? You know, who who would just kind of line up like that? That's a, that's a surefire way to get to be able to pick off the English troops as they get as they get nearer. And, and they're on, they're walking on a highway, but the the pale green bits to either side of that, those red, the red English army, that's actually bog land. So you, it was so clever, wasn't it? So, so not only did he kind of get them to, to go up the middle of that bog, but the two, if you look at then the two side bits, there's two um, greyer uh, lines, and, and those you mentioned, ditches, Jenny, mm -hmm. and, and those represent where they think the ditches were. So even anyone, any of the English who got themselves into the bog and then out of it would get you know would come to could come to no good because it'd end up in one of his in one of his ditches and i just thought wow that's that's a a guy who's really really good at military tactics and strategy isn't it yeah and using using the landscape as a weapon as well isn't it terrain tactics was absolutely one of bruce's forties um mm. like definitely he knew how to to plan ahead and make the ground work for him um, I mean, the, the battle just preceding this one, the, the Battle of Glen Trull, that that was almost a, a 300 style affair because it said that 300 Scots came up against 1500 English. But because of the way that Bruce wangled the terrain to his advantage, they, they were basically, it was the same kind of idea. They're, they're literally forcing the English almost single file to come at them. Yeah. So with that bottleneck effect, they don't have to deal with the entire army. You just have to deal with the few that That's come it, right in front. Of yeah, the, yeah. You know, so. yeah. Was that not the Stirling Bridge um, tactics? That, as that well? was the same kind of idea for mm. Stirling Bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, like ten years previously. Clever. It is clever. It's not quite as infuriating as uh, Culloden, say. You know, where you had Charlie is just. He, he just felt like he had a right to win. God was on their side. They were going to win. It didn't matter. No tactics were needed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, <laughs> when I was reading through about, um, uh, you know, about what, how, how he set up Loudon Hill, of course, as you said, there's also that, that um, bottleneck effect that happened at Stirling Bridge. But, but he did the same at Bannockburn, did he? He had, well, he had his men placed in a good spot, but he had also kind of laid traps and everything for 
for the English. And, and once anyone did come off their horse, they, they were also going to find themselves in, you know, one or other of those wee burns, which we kind of think, well, it's just a wee burn. But presumably, by the time you've got several thousand horses going over it and, and men going over it, it's going to be an Plus absolute you your heavy armor. Yes. Yeah. 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 And clearly they, they didn't learn from the experience because they just kept walking into the same trap. I suppose it, it is kind of hard to, to defeat a tactician that's able to use the, the ground to their benefit. Because mm -hmm. how do you defeat nature? How do you... I, I can understand like how the English would have been frustrated by that, but also not have any other real go to in that situation you know it's not like they could go no 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 right okay this doesn't work for us uh right reschedule <laughs> for next month um and we're going to we'll, we'll work at a better place okay we'll work at someone more equal we'll come at each other on more equal terms next time do you know what i mean mm. there, there was no kind of <laughs> ability to have a redo so once bruce had got in there and laid the ground for, for his battle, and, and I, I assume he was one of those kind of leaders where he could see in his mind how this was going to play out mm. um, to, to actively thwart any options that the English might have had um, to really kind of make sure all his bases were covered. Um, I, I would think he would have been quite a formidable person to come up against in battle. Yeah. Yeah. Plus oh, yeah. the fact yeah, yeah. He, he wasn't just like a bookworm that sat there working out the, the best tactics. He worked it out knowing that it would work to the point where he was prepared to take active part in mm -hmm. the battles. He was prepared to get in there with his men uh, yeah. and um, prove that, that his tactics were going to win out, you know, to prove that his own confidence in, in how the battle was going to go, I guess, you know. There's, there's a knock-on effect then to, yeah. to um, confidence but their amongst confidence. his men. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. It's quite a good kind of feeling to think about it because you're thinking about the camaraderie. You're thinking about how everyone's in this together. Um, there's, I was going to say there's not a split faction, but of course we know that there were Scots who were loyal to Balliol at the time, yes. who was Edward the First pawn. Yeah. So it wasn't just English they were fighting. That's why I had to stop myself previously from saying the English faction because it wasn't really the English faction. In a lot of things, right up until the 18th century, you had the Scots divided, didn't you? It's always yeah. hard. You yeah. can't get two yeah. Scotsmen to agree on anything. Yeah. <laughs> they still do, don't we? <laughs> that's it. You, you find that a lot from a lot of the battles where Scots were very rarely fighting just English foes. They were often mm. fighting um, those of their own nationality who had been swayed or coerced or bribed into... Um, yeah. Yeah. supporting the the faction that was against their own kind of best interests but again that that's just we've not stopped doing that have we well no. i know i mean it, and it happened throughout england didn't it whenever england started fighting itself it was it was the same thing you know the like you know the um lancastrians and the orchists and so there was <laughs> uh bruce and and his men so then they've got that they've got themselves in this really good position. Also, they've got the hill at the back of them, so you know there was no way that they could be they could be got at from either side or from behind. And then, mm -hmm. and then there's a there's basically a, a slaughter that 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 kind of field in front of them, and and the, the track way and the ball yeah. becomes a, a, a slaughter slaughter. In, English confidence is going to have plummeted almost as soon as that battle started just from the setup alone. Apparently, know. apparently, there's some evidence that after it got going, of course, all the action was happening at the front, but then the rest of the, the Pembroke and his, his men were coming, pressing in behind. But by that time, mm -hmm. the ones at the back had started to think, no, this isn't going to work and, and, took, themselves, yeah. and took themselves away. They were just lining up like cattle to the yeah. slaughter. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. They, they just had to put up a wee bit of a fight before uh, their their day suddenly was cut short. Yes. You can understand those men feeling like maybe it was more hassle than it was worth to continue. But yes, um, and they, they wouldn't have had a choice in the matter. Oh, I know. know. That's um, true. Like, what was the media and the media aftermath of winning this battle? I mean, how did that affect uh, Bruce and, you know, his chances and at that point? Um, well, I mean, it obviously worked for them. Do you know what I mean? I mean, every battle that they won led them on to greater confidence for the next, which is why this 
effectively tiny Scottish army kept going yeah. on to, to get wins right up until seven years after at Bannockburn. You know, I think that that it was a confidence that, that was built every time they had one of these successes. Mm. It just added to more. So, and of course you had children growing up who weren't old enough to fight at Loudon Hill, but they'd seen their fathers win and they'd they'd heard the reports. So they, these were becoming canon for, for Scottish children. You know, th this wasn't history that they were being taught. This was contemporary affairs and they're yeah. being taught that it only takes a handful of Scots to win out against the military might of the English, mm -hmm. you know, and and being brought up like that, you can understand that, that these children who've become men at Bannockburn, they, they're going to have been just in full confidence. There would have been no doubts in their minds yeah. that yeah. anything was possible, that England could try what they wanted, that, that even with Scots on the English side, it, it didn't seem to... To, to prevent true Scots as they would have seen themselves winning out against mm -hmm. all odds, you know, and you can imagine that, can't you? You know, it's like a gambler. If you're going out and you're just winning every hand that you're playing and you're maybe only losing the odd one, that they wee losses are only going to have dented your confidence any, do you know what I mean? Because you're going to be like, yeah, but I've won all them before, so let's just continue and see how this plays out, you know, like. So hopefully somewhere at the moment in Scotland is, is a master tactician who's just working out how to get, you know, yeah. a small number of rather fractious people who are prone to argue with each other at the drop of mm. a hat to come together to, you know, knock, knock Spock's off them. Absolutely. So, Jenny, thank you so much thank for coming. You. Really, really You're enjoyed welcome. talking to you. And it's uh, it's uh, it's great that we ask you to do these things and you just say yes and appear. And, of course. And, uh, <laughs> Now that we've got that diagram, Marlene, I'm really fascinated to see when we speak to Neil and, and Lynn, who were there, if they recognise any of that landscape, you know, from, from what they're looking at. I mean, the, the photos that I saw of it, it just looks beautiful. You know, the rolling green hills just as far as the eye could see. But I think it's quite atmospheric when you've got yeah. echoes of something that's happened there. Yeah. Charlie, wow, and draw the sword, wow, and up and rally at the Royal Prince's War. Think and scorch as ancient heroes, think and foreign foes repel, think and loyal Bruce and Wallace, for the produce of Burkwell. Having heard a little bit more about the history of the hill, we also had Lynn and Neil who were on the hill to tell us more about what it was like on the ground, what they could see. When we had climbed right up to the top of the hill um, and looking down and you're going, oh, that's where it was there, over yeah. here. And then you could, you got the idea, like, I mean, this hills, and, it, and it's such a you know really stands out obviously because it's like it is a volcanic plug so you yeah. can imagine that the picture of it yeah everything else is just eroded away around it and this it sticks right up in the middle <laughs> in the middle and you're looking down and you can see why the battleground was kind of chosen because again and i think that's quite true of lots of battles in in scottish history is that those on the on the Scots side are going, well, we know the land. We know the lie of the land. We know what's there. We know if it's marshy ground. So if people are coming in on cavalry, well, they're going to get stuck in that. Um, That's exactly what Jenny was saying, that the tactics involved were to do with the landscape. 
it's just exactly as you've said it. Yeah, yeah she, she was she thing. was saying she thought she thinks Bruce was a, a master strategist in that respect. Well, and in a way, he had to be. He didn't have as many men. He didn't have well, anything right. like as many men, and and they weren't so well armed yeah. um, either. But but what you said just now that is just gets it in a nutshell, doesn't it? That he knew yeah. the land or. There must be a way of drawing the enemy towards you as well, because you know why? Well, why? Why would they bother? Really? Why? Let's put your diagram up, Marvin. I put that up then. The bright green bits at the top—that's the hill, and the yellow, the three yellow squares uh, are, are where he had drawn up, where Bruce had drawn up the Scots. So the Scots are in yellow, and in all the red bits, so that whole line of them—that's the English. So of course you look at that and you think, well, what on earth was? It was the Earl of Pembroke who was in charge, and uh, yeah. he's like, "Well, what was he doing? Because <laughs> he's just gonna—they're just gonna pick off the front bunch, and then there'll be the next bunch, and then uh, and and it's because they're on a roadway that's relatively solid. Either side, that sort of lighter green colour—that's bog, and right over at the both sides, you can see there's two sort of lines there. But well, that was Bruce had got his men to dig." ditches there so even if any yeah. of the english got through the bog they were still going to get stuck in 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 the ditches how did he get them to go there <laughs> the hill that we're up is really steep it's like a, a you know it's a volcanic rock basically but um, this one that one but, yeah that's right so but the battle is across the river on a sort of very flat area oh and, and so it's not actually on um, back it up onto Loudon Hill as as we were up it. Ah. It's, it's a few hundred meters anyway away. Presumably, though, so whatever they are, but the, whatever is sitting behind the Scottish um, uh, uh, soldiers is solid ground with a bit of cover on it. Is it? it, it well, it, if, when you look at it, it looks like it is a slight hill. Yeah. So they'll be coming from the road onto this flat area. They'll see the Scots ahead on a wee bit of hill, yeah. and then they've gone all this bother of digging and stuff, and we in advance, and they've just drawn them straight in and yeah. up and into it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So yeah. who all was there when you were there? Because we, I saw a flag from the the Wallace Society. I saw the Robert the Bruce Society, but it was also static saltires. So how how come these groups all got together? The static saltire groups a fairly new one. This is Brian Cunningham, mm. and um, basically he's been coordinating a lot of the, the stuff recently. So he's based up in Dundee and Aberdeen mainly. Um, I met him in Dundee, um, but he's he's now focusing on all the information he can get about any event that's on on a Saturday. So well, he posted the one about Stirling as well, and so we met up again in Stirling. But what, what was interesting was after we'd been there and been up the been up the hill and had a look around and um, came home and watched out Law King. Oh, oh yeah, I found that. I, I was because, just googling Got Loud and Hill and found Netflix out Law King. Yeah, <laughs> and it, because the hills I actually you know it actually features in the film, and then when you when it comes to the battle scene, it is pretty gory and brutal. And as you say, the Scots were from from my little bit of research on it. Bruce had about six hundred men, <coughs> and the Earl of Pembroke had three thousand, wow. including including cavalry. It wasn't yeah. just infantry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they had um, well outweighed in in terms of size. However, what they had done, and, and it's almost like it's quite rudimentary, they had chopping down trees and sparking it, sharpening them to make spikes and then sticking them in the ground. But mm -hmm. because there was that slight dip, you couldn't see them. So coming yes. down, they didn't yes. know what they were approaching. And, and when they've got these cavalry, I mean, it's just... As an animal lover, it's horrible watching mm. the film as these horses are going over and being impaled. And um, but then it, it takes you back to kind of the Battle of Bannockburn as well. And I remember reading about that, and they used the calthrops, which are like the kind of yeah. three pointed yeah. devices that they put, they just chucked into the ground so that the people were going to stand on it. And it yeah. didn't matter which way they landed, there was yeah. always a spike sticking up. So, yeah. I, yeah. As, 
cavalry and foot soldiers. I came. mean, it went before we spoke to Jenny um, uh, about to get some more background about the battle. I was um, googling, ended up on Wikipedia as you normally then do, and um, just reading about it. And actually, what struck me, what what came into my mind was just well, I, I know this. So this is thirteen. 1307, so another seven years before Bannockburn, but you got the impression that, that what Bruce learned from what he did at, uh, you know, near Loudon Hill must have stood him in good stead, because it's the same, isn't he, on, yeah. at Bannockburn? He's, he's already done it before, he's already done it at Glen Trill as well. Yes, and he, you know, at Bannockburn, he kind of pulled, he kind of pulled the English towards him, and 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 then there's there's various burns that are there, and there's also stake holes and everything that 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 he set up. So you can kind of see that, you know, what what their techniques. Yeah, it seems that the English have always got the equivalent of this enormous cavalry contingent that we don't ever have. Yeah. And so projecting forward as well, when you look at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, it's exactly the same sort yes. of thing. We that, yeah. you know. I don't think it's an area. It's a, a an area where there has been any, you know, proper archaeological digs done. But but someone in um, I don't know whether it's Historic Scotland or or uh, maybe just a local council archaeologist is look is is looking at is being looked at um, mm. just to kind of assess it because you'd think. You know, with that, when you know it was, it happened there. There's bound to be stuff under the, you know, under the ground yes. that they could, a, they could get. Even a metal detector or well, something. Well, a metal, would... de you suspect metal detectors might have been there, but um, I don't know if any of the any of the soldiers, either the Scots or the English, were buried there. But you know, there might be. Yes, bodies. that's supposed to be what the what was the area called that we looked over mm. Wallace's grave or. Now or Cairn. I'm just looking at the archaeological site. It usually comes up at Canmore. Yes, yes, yes. And they do have stuff there, but it's all about um, the area of the Roman fort that's there as well. Oh. Well, it's a kind of an obvious place, isn't it? As a yeah. fortified spot, whether you're a, you know, a Roman or Iron, Iron Age um, picked or something. Oh, and, but, and uh, views, panoramic views panoramic as well. Views, you can yeah. see anybody coming yeah. to you. When you were talking about having the detectorists out, when we were there, there was a man with his metal detector. Oh. And, I, and I was like, oh, have you found anything? And he's like, no, I'm looking for my <laughs> wedding ring. I lost it last year. <laughs> Oh, and all I found is this massive sword. Have either of you fathomed where Wallace comes into this? I mean, we had a bit of a chat about that with Jenny because Wallace, you know, in 1307, Wallace had died two years before. Well, he'd been executed two years before, so he certainly wasn't at that battle. But, but he seems to be terribly yeah. associated with it. If you Wikipedia it, there's um, the trying to actually put down his connection to the area. So on the one hand, you've got the geographical references to him being there, mm -hmm. um, but then it's kind of disputed whether he was there or not. And it's not a major battle he's involved in. This yeah. is more an ambush that he's involved in, where he hears of supplies coming up from England along this main route. Uh -huh. So he does an ambush on the route. And, so that yeah. was, but that must have been some while before. Yes, indeed. Yes. And, and that, th that's interesting because what Jenny was telling us was she thought there had been an earlier Battle of Loudoun and it w involving Wallace. This had only come from Blind, Blind Harrow, yeah. which she kind of dismissed as legend rather than fact. Yeah. But his name is there. And yeah. you know, these, these things come from somewhere, don't they? Well, that's right. And it's not a huge battle, but it is another battle. And it's a massacre, effectively. And this is where he buries all the, the English in these mounds that we refer oh. to. Oh, so yeah. that could have been burials from the earlier skirmish. But also, than the later was he not um, like William Wallace of, of Eldersley? Yeah, Paisley. Yeah. And that's not too far yeah. away from this oh. location. Um, they picked their battle sites. I mean, when you watched it, when, you, when I watched um, Outlaw King, and I'd remember doing it a, a little bit. I didn't do history at school. You had to do it in first and second year. You got no choice in it. Yeah. And it was awful. It was so boring. You know, the school I went to had part of the Antonine Wall literally <laughs> across the road in Calendar Park. Did we get taken out to see it? 
No. Uh. And what they <laughs> taught us in history, it, it was all kind of like Second World War, American Civil War, and you're like... If you got taught that, you were lucky. I got taught Henry the Seventh. <laughs> and a star and the court of Star really Chamber, hates. which um, you know, I know nothing more about it than the name these days. Of course, I dropped history as fast as I could after those two years, which actually now, you know, I, I think, well, I mean, I was fine and enjoyed doing geography instead, but I think, well, what a shame because it just put me off completely. When you think about it, it's like, well, what were, what were, what was being taught in the curriculum then now? Neil, exactly Neil you loved history, but you had a really good teacher who brought it to life for you. Yeah, yeah. So that made the that made the difference. Yeah. Scottish history is dampened down. Why are we not teaching the wars of independence? Um, mm. Doesn't really come into the curriculum, and you're like, it's part of our history, and the lessons yeah. to be learned from that, you know, yeah. particularly now, what's going on? Okay, it's um, it's different methodology that's being used, but the same principles are being applied to keep the Scots, you know, in their box type of thing, and, um, and un unaware of what their own people had been doing in the yeah, past. But if they don't teach you the history you can't learn from it yeah absolutely yeah. this yeah. might be a good point to mention that we have a scottish history playlist on our youtube channel and yeah. not only does that have clips from loudon hill and wallace's cave that we visited a couple of weeks ago and various other bits it's also got the whole series of radical scottish history podcast which is an excellent series and it is filling that gap of what was scottish history about done by somebody who was on the side of the Scots yeah. as opposed to, you know, the official version. So yeah. if anybody's interested in knowing more about our own history, you'll find it on that playlist. Yeah. Uh -huh. Did it have an atmosphere, the place? So, you know, sometimes places <laughs> where there's been battles have a kind of well, it's feeling got about it. Well, it's sort of look and feel about it because um, it's a volcanic rock. You know, it's a bit like Edinburgh Castle or um, mm. Salisbury Crags and... Arthur Seat in Edinburgh, that kind of the same sort of feel. Yeah. Um, it's lot scree and rough, and usually you've got sheep. And if you go in and explore these areas, it's full of wildlife and sheep tracks and uh, ruined buildings and all sorts of stuff hidden in the woods. And yeah, mm. so it has a very distinctive sort of mm. feeling. And, and you know, if once you venture to a very steep top, then uh, the, the panorama from the top is incredible. But it was a wee bit, a wee bit hazy looking out to the west. But you could see Aaron clearly. Uh, um, so again, as a kind of vantage point. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I mean, yeah. we know as far back as the the Roman fort was there, so it was obviously a strategic point mm. for them. Um, but you, you would imagine they would have lookouts and all sorts on the, the hill itself. Yeah. That would be the first. Yeah. That would indication. be the first thing. Yeah, yeah. That was really nice. The fact that you were actually there and you can report back from what you saw, what you felt. It's an absolutely cracking day. Yeah, it looked like I think it. It looked beautiful. Have you seen the list of battles in Scotland that we've got to go to? <laughs> 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 I mean, like many people in my age in Scotland, I didn't get any. I didn't get taught any Scottish history. You hear mention of the Battle of Loudon Hill and you go, where, 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 where was that? When was that? Yeah. Who was fighting who? Yeah. So this is us doing our little bit to put that right. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say we were now experts, Fiona. About, a bit, bit better about, informed, but, though. Uh, much, yeah, much better, much better informed. I, I really, I just really enjoyed, you know, the chats that we've had to put this, mm. put this together, and I hope other people are, are, are appreciating it as well. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye now.
Friedensam, wo schwang mit Rach, Riemann stand, auf Riemann vor, Latem von Lee. By oppressions, woes and pains, by your sons and servile chains, we will drain our dearest veins, but they shall be free. Lay the proud you suffer low, Tyrants fall in every foe, Liberties in every law, Let us do our deed. Scots wae, when Wallace fled, Scots when Bruce has a fight led, Welcome to your goody bed. Oh, 